Hello and welcome to this edition of Middle East Matters on France 24. Coming up on this week's show, extreme temperatures, rising sea levels and prolonged drought. The Middle East is warming almost twice as fast as the global average as leaders from 120 nations meet for the COP27 conference in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. We bring you a special programme on how climate change is already impacting countries in the wider region. More than 400 million people in the Middle East face potentially devastating consequences as the region heats up. A recent study suggesting the temperatures could rise by as much as 5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, bringing with it life-changing impacts from water scarcity to extreme heat waves. Cathy Clifford has more. In Iraq this summer, the mercury soared above 50 degrees Celsius. This is a climate study found temperatures in the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean are rising almost twice as fast as the rest of the world. Experts warn the region is on course to gain five degrees by the end of the century. In some countries, this would mean temperatures could exceed human endurance thresholds. Such a rapid increase has wider implications. Sandstorms, while typical in the region, have become more intense and more frequent prompting the closure of schools, businesses and the grounding of flights, costing the region's economy an estimated $13 billion a year. As the region grows hotter and drier, the UN has warned crop production could drop 30% by 2025, while the World Bank predicts the region will lose 6 to 14% of its GDP by 2050 because of water scarcity. Jordan, one of the world's driest countries, was forced to double its water imports from Israel in 2021. In Egypt, farmers have had to adapt to rising sea levels, switching to crops more resistant to salt and dryness. Mass displacement of populations as coastal land is inundated will not be limited to rural areas. In the Egyptian city of Alexandria, two million people, that's nearly a third of residents, could be displaced if the sea level rises by half a metre. Experts say the predicted temperature increase would compromise water and food security for the region's 400 million people, raising the risk of armed conflict. Well, to discuss how all of this is impacting the region, we're joined now by Delphine Aklok, food and agriculture researcher and consultant specialising in the Middle East. Great to have you with us, Delphine. Firstly, climate change it presents a two-pronged challenge for the Middle East, impacting oil income as the world increasingly shifts to renewables and also by raising temperatures. What is being done to address those challenges? Actually, um, there is an increased engagement of the different countries of the Middle East um, in adaptation strategies uh, that is really important for um, middle-income countries and low-income countries that are really uh, threatened by uh, climate change. And we can see that those threats are both in land degradation, and so they, they try to um, develop new ways of uh, cultivating, for example, with climate-smart agriculture, or uh, trying to innovate, they all started to diversify their economies and try to uh, develop uh, new uh, new sectors uh, and also especially new uh, energy, renewable energies. But also we have the low and middle income countries who don't have so many resources uh, in oil and gas. And those countries, they have to cope with uh, water scarcity with land degradation and desertification, but also with uh, rising sea levels. And especially as the COP27 has been inaugurated in Egypt, we see how this country is really a hotspot for climate change. As you're suggesting then, Delphine, clearly a lot needs to be done in the Middle East. We really need a transformation there. But how can the necessary change happen in such a politically fraught and divided region? Yes, that's one of the main points. How can we um, do uh, climate adaptation in a, a place where uh, there are so many conflicts, so many tensions? Uh, also, we have uh, some um, tensions between the sharing of um, uh, transboundary uh, water ground uh, tables. How can we share a transboundary uh, underground water 
when uh, countries are developing faster than the others. So the, the, the question of um, regional cooperation is really at the center of uh, tackling of climate change. And for the moment, we, we don't really see a, a real uh, regional uh, cooperation uh, happening. Um, Delphine, farmers, obviously, they're living in sun-soaked countries across the Middle East, but they need water to irrigate their crops and to keep their businesses afloat. Talk to us about some of the challenges they're facing, just trying to do that, just trying to keep those businesses going. Of course, we see some major innovations that try to... Uh to cope with uh, water security and drip irrigation is today considered as one of the most effective solutions for farmers to save water and to increase their productivity per drop. But of course, it doesn't work for every crop. It requires investments in pipes, in pumps, and above all, it needs a continuous flow of water, which is not possible, for example, in some areas of the region. So there is a real lack of uh, uh, justice between the different farming areas, between the different farmers, and we have to, to cope with the uh, diversity of the region at the plot level, at the national level, at the regional level. OK, Delphine, you are going to stay with us while we turn specifically to the COP27 host country. Now, it's served the needs of millions of Egyptians for millennia. The Nile was once a seemingly infinite water resource, but it's no longer able to support the needs of those who depend on it. Water scarcity is affecting the country's agriculture sector and food prices. Our correspondents have been meeting some of those hardest hit by the effects of climate change. Edouard Dropsy sent this report. Today is a special day in Safat el Kamar, 30 kilometres south of Cairo. Yasser is finally getting access to drinking water. A farmer and father of five, he's glad to be leaving behind the risks of unsafe water. It comes from underground streams. It's unsanitary and it's not safe. There's sand in it and it's bad for children and people. Yasser had little option but to drink untreated water drawn from this illegal pump. UNICEF, the UN Fund for Children, gave him a loan of $130, which he has to pay back within two years. From now on, he'll be able to drink safe water and drink it legally. The fines can be up to 5,000 or 6,000 Egyptian pounds. I'm poor, so I wouldn't even be able to pay 4,000. The waters of the Nile, a symbol of prosperity in Egypt since ancient times, are no longer enough to support the needs of a growing population. 98% of the country's 109 million inhabitants, like Yasser, are directly dependent on the river. 500 kilometres further north, are the fertile lands of the Nile Delta, Egypt's bread basket. Since time immemorial, they've used the Nile's waters to irrigate the fields here. So you see the water comes from here and it leaves over there. Mohammed grows rice and needs to flood his land. Since agriculture accounts for 80% of the consumption of drinkable water in Egypt, the government has imposed stricter controls on the use of resources. Further north, where the land is less rich, Sobi's family has been growing jute for generations. It too is a crop that needs plenty of water, but he is at the back of the queue. I want to irrigate, he wants to irrigate, that guy too. Everyone wants their turn. OK, but how do we do it? We try to work one after the other. For more than 10 years, rising sea levels have led to higher salt content, which is degrading Sobi's lands. He's losing heart. I was born here, but if there's nothing left, where should I go? I'm going to have to give it all up and leave. It's over. I'm going to have to take my chances elsewhere. As it faces a future with dwindling water supplies, Egypt will have to explore new ways of protecting this vital resource. Its population could reach 160 million people by 2050, meaning demand will only increase in the coming years. 
Delphine Aklok, food and agriculture researcher, is still with us. Delphine, Israel and the United Arab Emirates have invested heavily in environmentally friendly innovations when we're talking about the Middle East, but Egypt doesn't have the same resources. The government has, though, been investing in water treatment facilities. Can COP27 serve as a springboard for the host country, do you think? Actually, yes, Egypt is um, a bit uh, delayed in his uh, environmental policies because of um, a, a strong um, economic crisis today, but also because we, we have seen a, a special uh, uh, will to, uh, to develop the economy and the environment was more um, less, uh, less in, in, in the target. But today, with the uh, rising sea levels, with uh, the uh, challenges about food security, about water security, we, we have a, a kind of a set of new policies, new strategies. Of course, the COP27 should um, uh, in, accelerate this, uh, these trends of strategies. But I, I would like just to, to mention the, the, law, uh, the water law that, that was passed in uh, 2021 and which tries to uh, regulate the access to water, to um, control and, regu and regulate the uh, different crops that are uh, allowed to be, uh, to be uh, grown, especially in the Nile Delta. Um, all these strategies, all, the, all these um, um, political strategies to, to cope with uh, climate change, to cope with water scarcity, they have to take into account uh, the communities and uh, the, the, the people who are living on the land. OK, Delphine, we leave it there. That is Delphine Aklok, researcher at Tour University. Thanks so much for your time on the programme. Well, with all eyes on Egypt for the COP27, the host country's human rights record is also in the spotlight amid growing calls for the immediate release of a prominent jailed activist who's been leading a hunger and water strike. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says Ala Abdel Fattah is in great danger. He's been repeatedly arrested over the past decade for his role in highlighting alleged human rights violations by Egyptian security forces and the use of military courts to try civilians. The UN body says all activists and others affected by climate change should be given a seat at the table at the COP conference. Well, that's it for this special edition of Middle East Matters. Stay with us here on France 24 for more international news. Hello, I'm Annette Young, the host of The 51%. And in this week's special edition, we're here in the US as it gears up for the midterms. But with the Supreme Court having made that decision to roll back the constitutional right in accessing an abortion, these midterms have indeed become a milestone election for American women voters, especially here in the southern state of Kentucky. The 51% presented by Annette Young on France 24 and France24.com.